The economics organizations have solicited three opening questions from the attendees, and we'd like to start with those in order to frame the conversation today before we open up the floor to other questions from the audience. So, Dr. Brizal, could you please begin by telling us about your career path and how you realized that you wanted to become involved in international economic development? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, it's interesting for me because I'm at the moment on leave from the center and resident at Harvard Kennedy School writing a book. And the book is supposed to be kind of a memoir that's work-based. So how did I end up where I am? And I think particularly for the women, there aren't that many of you in the room, one of the things that I've learned thinking about it is it was far more serendipitous than I would have expected. And I think there's a grain of um, kind of uh, advice for young people that I didn't have a career path in mind. I got interested in Africa. I did American Studies as an undergraduate. Then I went to uh, public, to the School of Advanced International Studies. So I went from American Studies to International Studies. <laughs> I was curious. I wanted to go to a quasi-professional school, but I didn't want to do law or medicine or business, so I went to SAIS. Uh, I, 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 you had to pick a region, and I spoke some French, so I picked <laughs> Africa. And then a job some years later got me involved more in Africa but more specifically in population studies. And at that time, I was not an economist, obviously. And in that particular job, we were supporting scholars in the developing world who wanted to work on population. This was an era when USAID was just pouring money into population. Everybody was worried about the population bomb. So, um, through that job, I got interested in economics because we received proposals from scholars in the developing world in the social sciences. And the ones that I felt were the most compelling uh, in terms of testing models or ideas or using empirical evidence to appropriate, you know, to get to some kind of association of something with something else were in economics. So, when I was 30 years old, I applied to go to do a graduate program in economics. So, bottom line, <laughs> in economics, I got interested in the development because I've been working on Africa with scholars from Africa. So it kind of goes like that. Um, so, bottom line, for those of you who are either undergraduates or recent graduates, don't worry, you have some time before you find necessarily your path. And the second opening question we have is, what are the challenges of working in international economic development, and what, if any, are the unique challenges that are faced by women in the sphere of work? Uh, well, I mean, I think of the challenges as, the way I think of it is, international economic development for me is, this great combination of analytically fascinating. There's, you know, so many ways to think about, so many different challenges. There's no end to what you can be worrying about, thinking about, working on, and studying. It's also morally compelling. So at some time in my life, I did, <clears throat> and that's a, another complicated story, get, feel kind of mission driven. And after I did a PhD, because my former husband was in Washington and I had a small baby, uh, I went to the World Bank, which was a great job for me. I didn't want to go back into teaching, or I didn't want to follow the usual path of getting it, becoming an assistant professor. I already knew too much about the world. The opportunity cost was very high for me because <laughs> I'd already earned more before I started graduate school than assistant professors earn, and no, no university was going to recognize those skills, etc. So um, I went to the World Bank, and I uh, had several different offers in the bank, but I wanted to stay 
for longer doing policy research. So what are the challenges, I think, for women especially, but even now I see it for men, as men face, more young men face that um, challenge of balancing work and family life than was the case many years ago. So I'd say one challenge is uh, the issue of who moves, when you move, do you travel a lot in whatever position you're in. Are you away from home and how you, how you can make that work. Um, <clears throat> what I did at the World Bank is I sort of hid in research and policy work for some years um, until I got promoted to a level where even if I, I was in operations but then not having to go for such long missions and I chose to work in Latin America. So those are examples where you can sort it out as you go along. Latin America because it's no jet lag, shorter trips, um, that sort of thing. So. The third question is, could you please describe some of the key policy strategies at the Center for Global Development for the promotion of international development? Yes, so when I founded the center, um, co-founded, but I was really the one shaping what it would be about, uh, I had been 20 years by then working in the multilateral development banks because after the World Bank, I was asked by Larry Summers, whose name you might know. He, was, he had just gone to the, uh, the, um, the international, what's it called, the, in the Treasury, the top mm -hmm. international person, not deputy secretary, whatever it is, and assist, not assistant secretary, whatever. And um, so he, he talked to me about, peculiarly, and this will be in my book, <laughs> the U.S., many of you may know, basically still decides who should be the president of the World Bank. Mm -hmm. um, they will approve probably tomorrow the candidate, who is not a very obvious or compelling candidate, that the Trump administration kind of you know, said, this is our guy. Um, and that can happen because the U.S. has uh, a lot of power still, not only in economics and development, but, you know, it has market power, it has diplomatic power and so on. So it's very t tough for other countries to say, no, no, we want somebody else. Anyway, so in addition to controlling, for, for all practical purposes, the presidency of the World Bank, the U.S. historically has also controlled the executive vice president at the Inter-American Development Bank, a vice president, at least one, at the Asian Development Bank, and so on, okay, at these big multilateral development banks. So Larry asked if I would be interested as the, uh, we're talking Clinton administration, Yes, 93, if I would like to have that position. So it was a great idea. I mean, I was very excited about that. It was a great job. So um, by the time I was founding the center, I had 20 years basically working in institutions that <clears throat> between advise and tell and finance, developing countries to do what they think, we think, the developing countries should do. It's very much about telling developing countries how to develop, right? With some money and sometimes very good sound technical advice behind the money. But I felt it was time in a changing world by now it's the year 2000, 2001, 2002. Uh, we see the, the beginning of the rise of, develop, of emerging market economies and so on. It was clearly time to watch, monitor, push, harangue, if necessary, the rich world, the multilateral banks, the US, because the US is 
so fundamentally important in the global order and in, in development policy. The UK, the Europeans, the Japanese, and so on. So um, that was the most important thing. And in the lecture today, I'm actually going to end it with a chart that we do every year, a sort of map of, of uh, the policies of the rich countries toward developing countries. How good are they? What kind of commitment do they reflect? The second key idea was not to focus only on aid and money, but to focus on the whole range of policies and programs where rich countries, big international institutions, affect the lives of people in the developing world. So that's trade, migration, uh, investment policy and technical te technolo technology transfer, environment, climate, and there's security, etc. So that's actually been pretty much the mission of the center, I'd, I'd say, in the last 10 years. So since about 2010, it's become that plus increasing emphasis on how the system overall works and the asymmetries in how the system works, the use of power and so on, um, and, you know, and collective action problems, for example, on the climate issue. So we're very different in the sense that we are independent. You know, we can look at the powerful players, but we're also kind of insider outsiders, a little bit insiders because many of the staff have worked in these institutions. They're familiar with the constraints and challenges of the countries themselves, um, whether it's uh, the U.S. Treasury, U.S. Aid, or DFID, or the World Bank, etc. Now I'd like to open up the floor to other questions from the audience. So if you have any, please raise your hand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. uh, so if you, what would you say is like your specialty, like region, I guess, or like I guess alternatively, like what is your most proud thing that you've worked on, or thing that you're, you know, most happy to see? to work on pretty much. Right, okay. So you're talking about me personally, the yeah. center? Yeah. yeah. So I don't, I never really did develop a regional specialty the way some people do. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's more typical of economists than, than people in international relations formally. Um, I have several obsessions, you know, that uh, I, saw, I got interested in income inequality within countries after working on East Asia, which had very, you know, minimal inequality of wealth and income. For interesting reasons, post-war, I'm talking about Taiwan, Hong mm -hmm. Kong, Singapore, China. For one thing, they, they were very, they had a shock in some of those countries of a distribution of land after the war, imposed actually by the U.S. That was, turned out to be a good thing. But they were also worried about the Chinese communists, so they were very anxious to make sure that their peasants and workers would not be co-opted by this huge threat that they felt. Then I worked on Latin America, and it's the opposite. Latin America is cursed in terms of its colonial history, its natural resources, um, so, and more recently, I've worked more on a, on Africa again, so it depends. <laughs> now, so income inequality, um, I have something in the business of aid that I, I have a book called Cash on Delivery Aid, which says, don't go and have a blueprint for how to fix your education system, you know, in Malawi. Mm -hmm. uh, train these many teachers, build classrooms, you know, change the curriculum, all that. No. Go and say to the government, this is the only exaggerating a little, there's currently a million kids enrolled in school. For every additional child enrolled in we're finishing primary school next year, $50. You bill us $50. You, you do your report. We have an independent audit. 
If it's a clean report, we pay you $50. What does this do? It puts all the initiative and all the risk in the hands of the government. And it also allows the government to tell its own people, we're going to get $50, and we're trying to do this, and we're trying to do that. But that permits civil society actors and the more educated potential voters to hold that government accountable. So it's the opposite of branding aid and saying, this aid came from USAID. So that's another example. And then my biggest obsession at the moment is climate and global public goods how to get them financed effectively and how to deal with the impending crisis for developing countries if the world doesn't figure out how to deal uh, more urgently and effectively with climate. So we've, I've done a lot of work on how that could be managed if the World Bank were to raise money from China and others. So I have a sort of ongoing project on the multilateral banks. <clears throat> what was it like dealing with the Latin American debt crisis in the 1980s? So, it's a great question. Um, <laughs> because in the 1980s, I was uh, in the World Bank, and I was working mostly, let's see, um, I'd say mostly on education and health projects in Brazil. This is getting to be the late 80s, and then on the Amazon and deforestation stuff, sort of vaguely environment. So, um, I was there in the weeds, kind of, you know, still quite early on in a way in my period working at the bank. And uh, in the background, in Brazil in particular, was the macroeconomic problems huge inflation, uh, poor management. So I saw it from the bottom because, <laughs> um, you know, it was very hard to get any loan approved to Brazil at one point because the macro people were saying it's, it's all going to go to waste. That's one thing. And we had this very good loan that we'd worked on uh, to to invest really in science and technology in the key universities. It would be the equivalent of lending money to the government to pass more resources to, uh, you know, Oakland University and California State and Harvard and whatever, right, to, to do fund basic research focused on agriculture and health, that sort of thing. So, <laughs> That's a, an interesting story because that loan was being, it was a struggle because inside the World Bank there was resistance at some point to moving any money into Brazil because they were trying to push, you know, we're not going to do this and we're not going to do that until you deal with your inflation problem. Um, what was the question? It was a good question. I dealing with a Latin American like the financial crisis in the 1980s. Right, okay, so this is the 80s. They're, the debt is accumulating. They have the problem of debt, the, of inflation in Brazil, but around, you know, in the region as a whole. So in the mid, by the late 80s came uh, the Brady Plan, first the Baker Plan, then the Brady Plan. And um, that is a really interesting example where the U.S., took leadership. Why? Mostly because they were worried about the banks on Wall Street. Um, most of that debt was held by the banks. So it was possible to put 10 or 15 bankers in the room and to work out a deal. And the deal included a lot of new lending called adjustment lending or structural adjustment lending or policy loans to Latin American countries. So I was a little bit a bystander when it was happening in the 80s itself, but I was a major player at the Inter-American Development Bank, for example, when the echo of it was the tequila crisis in Mexico in 1993, 94. And 
it's really interesting and exciting. I mean, we see it again. Those of you who followed the Greek debt crisis, mm -hmm. you get really, you have to understand both the economics of it and the politics around it. Who's, who are the losers and who are the winners? You know, and um, it's very complicated in the sense that when you have these big flows to deal with debt that come from the IMF and the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank to the government, you also have this, it sometimes interacts badly with the pre-existing income inequality. So, for example, if, if you know anything about the Russia uh, crisis in the 90s, right, and the effort to do structural adjustment and including privatization uh, and the use of vouchers on which they were advised by a lot of economic experts, you know, Harvard, Jeff Sachs, World Bank, the whole bit, but the whole thing went awry because uh, of the way they managed the implementation of this voucher program, they all ended up in the hands of, you know, the oligarchs, in effect. But it's very exciting and very, in a, in a way that's a little bit tragic, sort of stimulating, because a lot of people are losing. Um, and if you're poor and you're hit indirectly by this crisis, it can have permanent effects, you know, if your kids drop out of seventh or eighth grade and then never go back to finish secondary school, which is the sort of thing that we know happened uh, in Mexico, in Peru, and so on. The next question. <laughs> uh, could you please provide some advice to? I know many students they pursue economics degrees, but they're kind of lost at what to do right after they graduate. So, if you could um, provide examples of maybe positions of entry level jobs or internships they should pursue, and any kind of advice on the first steps they should take after graduating. Well, you heard that I didn't do economics. So, <laughs> then there wasn't such a thing as internships <laughs> in the olden days. Um, <laughs> I, I think, you know, uh, it's, it's a very personal sort of um, sense about this, but if, I think if my sense from people coming to me and asking me advice is, it's good to do a number of different things. So you can figure out what you really like to do. Not, not in terms of what organization, but what kind of work. Do you want to be doing academic work? Do you love to dig in, do research? You know, can you imagine writing carefully researched articles for peer-reviewed journals, etc.? Okay, then, you know, try that and consider going into a PhD program. If you're not sure, and I think a lot of people are not sure, then do something else. You know, try to get, see if you want to do more program orientation, work for an NGO, or go to the private sector and see how it works on the business side. And does the model that you learned in economics, is it applicable to the way uh, corp corporations behave, and private players, or small entrepreneurs, right? Um, some people, I think, really are good at managing things and getting things done and working with other people. So try to go to an organization where there's a good likelihood you'll get to do that. But the, I guess the main thing for me, you know, and it's just one experience that I'm reflecting, I don't think about this beyond my own experience. I do have children, and they seem to <laughs> muddle through, but uh, they never really ask me for advice. <laughs> <laughs> they seem destined at some point to be doing what they were doing, but um, I, I guess I believe in trying different things, and the thing is you'll do best in a job when you're enjoying it, when you're good at it. So think of it as a search for what 
you're good at. You touched on <clears throat> like the privatization of Russia in the 90s. Can you elaborate more on the transition from communism to democracy, either in Asia, Africa, or Latin America, and like your experience with that? Well, the only places that we're talking about Eastern Europe, Central and Eastern Europe, and Russia, mm -hmm. which haven't, and some of them haven't transitioned to democracy, right? I guess, you know, before I was working on these issues, you had, or simultaneous, many parts of Africa, maybe it's easier to think about it as economists as a very large transition across much of the developing world in the 80s and 90s from state, emphasis on the state as running things, as managing things, to uh, the shift to market-based economies. So I think it's associated for young people now, I find sometimes with this idea of neoliberalism and that neoliberalism can go too far, um, that it hurts people, sort of the problem of adjustment with the human face, which is a famous UNICEF report. Mm -hmm. Around the time, this is Reagan Thatcher first, right, in the 80s. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it's going on slowly in much of the developing world, and differentially, obviously, in different countries. And then it hits Russia with the fall of the Berlin Wall. It hits the USSR, and as, as the USSR breaks up, all those countries. So I'm not really, there's a, there's a, a, a very good world development report. Some of you might know the, the World Bank does a world development report every year. And around the year 1991, 92, they're on different topics. The one in 91, 92 was about the transition economies. So you can, if you're interested in that issue, it's amazing, you know, what went on and how it was different in Poland, Ukraine. I think Ukraine has never gotten past the corruption problem. Um, Poland has, Hungary's done okay. There's a lot of thinking about the, the, the Baltics, for example, where they became part of USSR later, after World War II, I guess. The, these countries that are farther west in Eastern Europe had already somehow this institutions around democratic norms and approaches that stuck. And that I think nobody really understands why that turns out ex post to be important to make a big difference in being able to make the transition successfully. But there's also tremendously interesting economics around it because, first of all, you had a huge increase in inequality mm -hmm. as uh, markets kicked in and some people were able to take advantage in a good way, you know, they were product they had productive skills and so on, and others got left behind where before, the, in the communist regime, there was more equal pay almost by by definition. But that's maybe more than I even should say in a disorganized way. It's not something that I've worked on myself. Uh -huh. So this isn't really a developing country, but do you have any comments or how this could potentially affect the World Bank, but the Brexit? So. Uh -huh. Well, Brexit's bad news. I'm sure you're all reading about that. Uh, <clears throat> you know, it's such bad news for the UK. I hadn't really thought about its effect on places like the World Bank. But it is true that the UK has the World Bank, some of you may know, has a hard window and a soft window. And the hard window is 
lending that's slightly below market rates, but closer to the market, the subsidy, the implicit subsidy is smaller, and that goes to middle income countries. And then it has this soft window called IDA, which is for the poorer countries, and which is almost grant-like. And in fact, some countries end up paying only the principal back, and after 40 years. So, so the UK, for several years, was the single largest contributor to the soft window. So, and there was some rule that the, you know, the contribution of the U.S. would trigger, they had some burden sharing agreement among the big rich countries about the relationship between the U.S. contribution and others. So it was important that there was another country that was close to and even exceeding the U.S. But this is just about money, right? And and about how much aid there is, which in some ways, well, it's important in, in the short run, I think tremendously important actually for getting kids in school and dealing with AIDS, the AIDS problem, and making sure kids get vaccinated, and, and these kinds of health and schooling, social programs. But in the medium run for growth, there isn't very much you can do with aid if you don't have good governance, a strong state, an effective state. And if you don't have that, you need like a charismatic leader or some other things have to be going well. That's one way to think about it. Although, you know, I don't want to sound too down on the chances. It's not consistent with the reality that all these countries have grown really a lot in the last 40 years, uh, as you'll see if you come to the lecture. <laughs> you know, just in a couple of pictures. I mean, it's a very different world. And then, of course, some of these countries have had just incredible rates of growth. Um, particularly, I mean, we know about Korea, but now it's China for sure. Um, India is growing quite rapidly, so there's a sense in which the development process is a success post-war, um, and that's important and interesting, so it's worth learning why, what works and what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Is there any nation you would like consider like one of the bigger successes of the last forty years? Like, can you like name a single one that's like we see definite progress here? Well, I think India is really interesting um, because it's so big, so poor, so ethnically diverse, yeah. linguistic diversity, etc. It's really hard to understand what's behind their success. I mean, there's some good literature that says it was the Hindu rate of growth, that was sort of the joke, right? For, for the first 30 years after uh, independence, 48 to 78, yeah, even more, 45 years. Then sometime in the 80s, uh, there came a government that said we're gonna be more business friendly. We're going to try to lift the heavy hand of the state regulatory stuff. We're going to invite in, be a little bit more open to having foreign direct investment, that sort of thing. But essentially business friendly. And so starting sometime mid to late 80s and then through the 90s and 2000s, India has achieved really quite extraordinary growth. Um, what's extraordinary is despite that growth, the median income per person in India is still two dollars, you know, I mean, so that's an interesting example. Then China, you can't not talk about China because it's another exception in a way. Um, everyone who predicted that you couldn't keep growing at that rate within an autocracy or in an authoritarian state that you needed some 
greater accountability, keeps waiting for the crisis in China. And now people are getting worried again that there will be a crisis, that the state-owned enterprises are overburdened with debt and blah, 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 but not happening. So there's a couple of very good books by, uh, there's a woman actually at Michigan, University of Michigan, who has a very good book, uh, worth reading the first few chapters to learn all about development. Um, on why, how China did it. And she has quite a lot of interesting stuff about incentives at the local level uh, that were put in place and sometimes um, abused, you know, like if you were the mayor or the district head, you could kind of strong arm all the police or all the teachers to contribute to start a new enterprise that would be a local enterprise, right? I mean, it's a very interesting, very different. Um, so if you're interested in that, I can't remember the name of her name, but she's either at Michigan, University of Michigan or Michigan State. And it's a Chinese name, like Yuan. I, I did a blurb for the back of the book, which means I read it. <laughs> That's what happens when you get to a certain age. Excellent. <laughs> you know, one of those praise things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering if the Center for Global Development has um, worked on any policy recommendations for the IMF in dealing with Ukraine and the loans they've been giving them, um, because currently they have imposed austerity measures and increased the price on gas and a lot of the people are having a difficult time dealing with such higher living expenses. Um, and the new presidential candidate, one of the two in the running, um, has said that he will be thinking of repaying the loans in alternative ways. Do you know if the IMF has discussed alternative ways of being able to repay the loans or if the CGD has given any recommendations? No. I don't know the specifics on Ukraine. Um, but let me say, give a couple of examples of... Of things we've worked on that are for the IMF. And then you remind me to go back to Ukraine. For what little I do know. Maybe you could tell us more. Share what you're thinking and what you know. But the, interest, the IMF, um, there are two areas where CGD has done some work. One is, um, for example, the NGOs in you know, about 2005, 2010 were really complaining about these adjustment policies uh, where the IMF would go in and say, you have to cut your fiscal deficit, you have to cut your spending. And uh, the IMF would not say you have to cut health, for example, or you have to cut schools, <clears throat> or even you have to cut fertilizer purchases. It would just say you must cut by X percent. So governments cut, and often that meant uh, cutting, especially sectors that in involve tons of people being paid civil service salaries. So the NGOs were getting, you know, more and more concerned. Um, so we actually uh, had a, a fellow at the center who had been, who was retired from the IMF and had headed the evaluation office of the IMF, which is sort of, after a while, the third party, the group that, that takes a third party look at IMF programs. And I kind of thought, honestly, because I asked him to work on this, and he set up a task force, and there were African ministers, and you know, blah, blah, blah. I sort of assumed that the NGOs were exaggerating, and that the IMF was much more uh, conscious and careful. Because by then, the IMF had been through the ringer on the need to help countries focus on you know, social programs and not hurt people in the context of reforming or fixing their macroeconomic problems. So it was a very macro-micro, they were trying to strike a better balance. 
Well, I thought a lot of this is historic, and the NGOs are exaggerating, and you know, so. Uh, he put together this task force, and the bottom line is they said the IMF could do much better. That the talk at the top and the statements of how they're doing had adjusted to these new realities and new information about the need to have a sort of social safety net in place. And to put some primacy on certain kinds of social spending during, a, a, in effect, a recession. But this had not filtered down to operational staff who continued to kind of go with the same flow. And an interesting example, it's a little bit technical, but if you're economics people, you'll understand. The, one of the things in the report that I remember is he showed that in middle-income countries that have both a high government debt and other, uh, let's see, other, okay, let me just stick, with, when they have high government debt, um, the IMF wants them to cut the debt, right, by, if they have some fiscal income to use, their, their tax income or whatever, to use some of it to buy down their debt, okay. But they don't do it as, they're not as tough on middle income countries as on poor African countries. Which kind of conveys that they're, the IMF staff in the poor African country is more worried that if it doesn't get done now, they won't do it later. Something like that. And in addition, the IMF staff were absolutely failing to take into account the expected flows of aid, which were actually quite high, for things like health and schooling. So bottom line, it was a mixed bag, but the NGOs were up, they had, they were on the right track. So that's one IMF thing about social safety nets. The other thing is that I did a lot of work on um, the problem of the VAT, in my opinion, the value-added tax which the IMF likes and which they promoted effectively. It's better than nothing. Uh, it's an easily administered tax, but it's a consumption tax, which basically in poor countries tends to fall on the poor. And I did quite a lot of work with a colleague on the reality that in some countries about the value at, an increase in the value-added tax can actually move people below the poverty line because even when there are exemptions and so on. For any of you who've studied taxes. So we're still kind of working with and pushing the IMF. Okay, good, that's good, you know, it's probably better than, it, it's very good for revenue generation, but there is this trade-off. So, I mean, my own position is, it's past time to start working with countries and they are now, like Senegal and Kenya, uh, some of the countries in Central America, on setting up the basis for a personal income tax. So in the U.S., the personal, in Europe, the valuated tax is about 30% of all revenue. And another 30% is corporate and other personal income corporate taxes. I don't know what the other 30% is. But in most developing countries, the VAT is 60% of revenue. And then they have trade taxes and others that are equally, very distorting, actually. So the IMF wants them to substitute more of that for trade taxes. Then I have a paper also on the insurance mechanism the IMF set up, which they're, they're not able to, there's, there's political problems with promoting it, under which countries, have, some countries have signed up, Mexico and Colombia, ex ante. They meet certain conditions. And they pay a small fee to have absolute guarantee if they get in trouble for an immediate, quick disbursement of IMF money. It's called the FC. I forget now. Fast. Anyway, there's a whole paper on it. <laughs> 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 yes, ha very good. 
Googled around <laughs> how China escaped the poverty trap. Yuan, Yuan, Ong. Yuan, Yuan, Ong. Thank you. This is the China book. <laughs> so, Ukraine. My guess is, well, first of all, in the last round, when Ukraine was in trouble, the U.S. pushed very hard for disbursements. Um, at what stage? This was uh, just after the bad guy was out and the better guy was in. 2014? Right. Pardon me? 2014? Probably, yeah. So that's how the U.S. was using its power kind of inside the IMF. It's a major owner. Um, I wouldn't be surprised now if the IMF is being quite sensible. I mean, the place is a mess. Why don't you explain what's, what's the situation? Currently, yeah. I think. Uh, well, we're now going into the second round of the presidential mm -hmm. debate. Uh, so one of the candidates actually a comedian. Um, the other one is the current president of Ukraine, uh, but it has been revealed that he has been involved in many corruption scandals. Uh, he is an oligarch and just found out that he's been making money off of the war. So his ratings fell very low and it's most likely that the comedian guy will be winning in the second round. Um, and when he was asked on um, how he'll be dealing with the IMF loans, how they'll be repaying it, he just said that they know of alternative methods of doing it rather than uh, raising the price on gas. So, oh. Which well, is how they were He's it. hoping to win the election, so. Right. I mean, I don't know if Ukraine has big subsidies for gasoline. Is that the problem? Um, they do. They're really bad. Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of those cases where the IMF just has the right idea that you've got to deal with those subsidies because there's fiscal drain and so on, and they help the rich more than the poor because the rich drive more and have bigger cars. Um, but it's also true that the IMF may be, you know, willfully a little naive about the reality of what anybody can do in the short run. A good, very good friend of mine is Ngozi Okonjo Iweala, who was the, she was the finance minister a couple of times in Nigeria. And at one point, because the, the subsidies in these oil-rich countries are just huge, and it's a complete disaster, such a distortion. And so they announced they were going to eliminate the subsidy. And I mean, it was chaos, you know, people rioted. And the problem, of course, is the rich benefit so much more from these gas subsidies, but at the margin for the poor, if the bus, if a bus trip ticket doubles, and you're earning three dollars a day, and it costs a dollar a day to go back and forth on the bus, a two-hour commute, and then it goes up to two dollars a day, you walk. You know, that's what happens. Outside of Nairobi, people now walk because they can't live in the city. It's, there's no space. No. And they'll walk two hours each way and then work for eight hours. So they have a 12 hour day and a four hour walk in order to not pay bus fares and sit in traffic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. You must have lots of fascinating stories and know lots of really exciting and interesting people like the finance minister of Nigeria. Uh, Nigeria who I think you were trying to like promote her a little bit to more. Be, I wanted her to be the president of the World Bank <laughs> the last round when the U.S. nominated Jim Kim. Mm -hmm. so, you know the problem is when one country has that control there are no incentives even to have a competitive candidate, you know, at the last minute, the White House picks somebody, sometimes kind of in desperation. <laughs> it's crazy. And so it's not healthy. But that's about global governance, which is another one of my themes. <laughs>
Well, that's what happens if you work on things for as long as I have. You, you can become a bit of a dilettante. <laughs> so can you within economics. Can you tell us a story? Pardon me? Can you choose a story to tell us? that like You're almost ready to wrap up, but can you give us like a nugget that would be valuable from your many nuggets? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, hmm. Once upon a time. Hmm. No, I'm thinking. What's a good story? Well, um... When I first started, I mentioned working on education projects in Brazil. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was kind of still sort of junior in the World Bank. And had let, just left research and was doing operations. I was a division chief, so, you know, the first level of management. And I, I came into this job that included health and education in Latin America. So I went with a project officer who had been developing the second basic health and education project for Northeast Brazil, which is a very poor region uh, in Brazil. And now we're back in 1980, so it was really poor. And it was the second project. So he, he, the task leader, sort of project manager from the World Bank, took me around and, you know, we went and saw, it was in three or four different states, we saw a couple of governors and so on and so on. And the more I saw and learned what was going on, the more unhappy I was. You know, this first project it just was not. You could see it was complete chaos and confusion in the way the system was organized. Because the states, at the state level, they ran the secondary schools and some primary schools. The municipalities ran the primary schools. The municipalities would often have mayors associated with the party that was the coalition, the member of the coalition, the party that's a member of the federal coalition. They have the education minister. That's the other thing. The last ministers appointed in developing countries until the last 20 years, whenever there was coalition government, would be health and education. So they would have to satisfy a region or a state in the coalition, if you understand parliamentary type systems or coalition party government, right? Or the, so anyway, they were never necessarily qualified, nor particularly interested. It was all politics. So it was just a mess. And, you know, we went to a couple of villages where the, the mayor, the school was in the mayor's wife's house, right? Oh, wow. And she had become the principal when <laughs> the politics changed, this kind of thing. And it was... So in the end, you know, the next... So I was very concerned about just pushing ahead with this, but the impetus that it is, you know, lend money, that's what we do, we lend money. And you see how very um, committed people to doing better, you know, they become, they come, become co-opted with the client, you know. The woman from the federal ministry was terrific, and she was the one, this was going to go to the federal ministry, and then they were going to be distributing it to the states and municipalities. The lobbying that goes on from the municipalities, oh my gosh. So, you know, <laughs> at the same time, I'd say, I would say looking back, I didn't have the same perspective on it that I have now. Now I sound very wise, you know, <laughs> thoughtful. <laughs> but, you know, I was a new division chief in a new region. This project is on the list you know, to get approved by the end of the fiscal year. And you have to get the document together. And so I was kind of unhappy, but I didn't slow it down. So in the end, it did not, it, it did, we delayed it enough, and they restructured it completely. You know, it, they, my, my group, worked on restructuring it. But even then, when it went through, we're just in the mid-80s, and 
the commitment to schooling in Brazil in the mid-80s was not there at any level. Mm -hmm. It was all about patronage and jobs. And that's, you know, the reality. So only later when other things changed in the country, uh, inflation came down, they got things on, on top of things macroeconomically. They had Fernando Enrique Cardozo as president, one of the greatest heroes mm -hmm. of development. Uh, there was a guy, Paulo Renato de Souza, who had been in the world in the Inter-American Development Bank, who became the Minister of Education. And the first time I went to visit him, I was no longer working on Brazil, but I was there for some reason, some conference or something. He took me up to the top floor of the ministry, and they had a phone bank. And this was before the internet and you know, Instagram and all that. But it was a phone bank, and anybody could call from anywhere. They had sort of 40 people. Uh, at the phone bank. Anybody could make a free phone call to complain or report from any part of the country. So that was a big change. That's not quite an anecdote, but anyway. I love Brazil stories. Oh, do you? Yeah. yeah. I'm a Warner Bear disciple, so. Pardon me? <laughs> I'm a Warner Bear disciple. Oh. Well, Brazil's sad now. Now it's scary. Now it's scary. We have unfortunately run out of time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Brazil, for your time and coming all the way to OU to answer students' questions and for all your insights and advice. It's an absolute honor to have you here. Sure. Good pleasure. Good questions. Good fun. <laughs> Good luck to all of you. Dr. Okay. Brazil's lecture on the effects of globalization and global development will be in the auditorium across the hall at 5, so we hope you can all make it. And there will be dinner here in the Stinson Center right after the lecture. And we hope you enjoyed this event. Thank you all for coming, and please grab some food. Thank and you to the organizers. <laughs> <laughs>